Now, I may not be a Loki variant, but I certainly know how to create a hell of a lot of mischief. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, you know, I was really happy to have with us today director Kate Heron to chat about the first season of Loki. I mean, it's, it's a near perfect season. It was a blast to watch. And what was so cool was to have Kate talk us through some of the bigger moments, some of her most personal moments, and what it took to get this season in the can. And it was kind of fun, I got to say, to find out that Kate has been a longtime podcast listener and had been listening before she even landed her first official directing gig, which makes it all the more fun to have her on a podcast. Of course, folks that now have produced credits as writers and directors, but were podcast listeners before they got their first produced credit, it's always fun to have you on the show. Of course, folks that are new listeners as well, you know, I don't discriminate, gosh. I, I tell you, but uh, th this was especially fun because it was it was just cool to hear Kate's story about being a podcast listener, and she gave a great interview, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. Uh, you know, we are just getting ready to publish our Black Widow issue. We, we were giving people a chance to see the movie, so we weren't giving too many spoilers away, um, but it's coming out very soon, and it's going to have a lot of great content in it, and it's going to have content beyond Black Widow because we're even post-publishing. Even after we publish, we add new content. We just slide a new digital article into the magazine. You know, you can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app backstory. And of course, for the Marvel fans out there, if you've never read us before, you should check out the free issue because it happens to be Avengers Endgame. So you can read our entire Avengers Endgame issue, see if Backstory is the right fit for you. And if you like it, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And your support would mean everything to us, but I want to uh, entice you. So you could use coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. You can only use it at Backstory.net, but you will still be able to log in on an iPad if you have one with your subscription credentials as well. So there's a lot of reasons to subscribe to Backstory. I hope you check out our table of contents, read the free issue, and see what we're about. Look, it means everything to me to have my podcast listeners in iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of these Zoom casts on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page become subscribers and support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our chat with director Kate Heron as she reflects on directing season one of Loki. Well, Kate, it's good to see you. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here, which always sounds so cheesy, but I genuinely am very excited to be here. <laughs> that's that's awesome. We are excited to have you. And uh, so, so look, I absolutely loved Loki, but we're going to split this up into non-spoiler first, not as long. Um, but but there will be a non-spoiler section, then I'll make a clear announcement where we're going into the spoilers. So, you know, just giving people a baseline for you, uh, tell us, you know, from whence dost thou hail and did you go to mm -hmm. film school? Yeah, so I, I'm from Southeast London and I did go to film school. So I was one of those kids that would like be putting on plays and with like all the other kids and like be like, come on, we're putting on a play today. And I made like sort of home video movies with my friends. I remember like, we used to make like Star Wars and we used to write on the like bits of paper and kind of hold it up to the camera like this to try and do like the scrolling text. And like, yeah, so I, I always love creating stuff. But I just didn't really know what a director did or like kind of what a filmmaker did. And basically I had really good teachers in the last few years of school. Cause I think originally I was like, Oh, I'll be an actor and I'm a horrible actor. So I'm very glad I didn't pursue that. And, um, yeah, and they just sort of opened my mind up and they introduced me to like the auteur theory and just loads of, you know, m massive directors that I hadn't even thought about. And so I basically ended up going to film school like very last minute. I just sort of pivoted and I, I think I made like these two like horror shorts with just friends of mine from school and was like, well, let's just see what happens. And sort of on a wing and a prayer, I got in and <laughs> like, yeah. And, and it kind of, I think the amazing thing with film school is it kind of taught me what all the roles on a film set were because, I you know, I, I didn't know much. I knew a director, a writer, and the actor, and that's probably all I knew, really. So I think for me, it was just helpful in terms of demystifying the process. Well, and then to my knowledge, you you went on to do some shorts, and you kept <laughs> doing shorts. And and as far as I know, tell me if I'm wrong, but your 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 breaking in story is basically on the Idris Takeover on TV in 2017. That's your first produced credit. 
Um, yeah. Is there anything you want to tell us about any odd jobs or anything that you were doing after yeah. film school in between? <laughs> we're happy to hear. Yeah. That. So basically, I, 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 I've been a waitress. I've been a temp at multiple places. I've worked in a bathroom warehouse. I, when I got sex education, I was working at a fire extinguisher company. Um, and, and when I actually got the Idris job, I was working for the National Health Center, um, sorry, National Health Service as a dental secretary. Um, so, yeah. And I remember that was the funny thing. So I got the Idris job and it was a short film. So it wasn't a very long job, right. but it was massive for me in terms of being on a set and showing I could work at that level. But I remember I got that and I was like, well, Idris Elba's in it. It's on BBC. I'm a filmmaker now and I'm just going to earn money from filmmaking. Like I've arrived. And I was back to temping, I think like a month later. Oh, and man. so, yeah, just, just because like I, you know, those shorts, they're, they're, so they're five minutes and there's five films, but it was still really hard to convince people to give me a TV break or right. a feature film because they were like, well, these are just so short. So I was, you know, sex education happened because I knew the DP who works with Ben Taylor, who was the main director on it. And he recommended me because we'd made a short film together and he was like, you should meet Kate. So he kind of stuck his neck out for me, which I really appreciate. And that's right. all and you did four episodes of Sex Education, which helped put you on mm -hmm. the map for sure. But before you did the TV show Sex Education, there was also Five by Five, right? Yeah. So Five by Five was the Idris one. And basically, so that's the one I did. So that was Idris Takeover and Five by Five were the same thing. The same thing. Got yes, it. Sorry. exactly. The, the wildest part of all this, and I know something that our listeners definitely want to hear, is put us in the room to get the Loki <laughs> gig. Because yeah. you've done shorts, you've done four episodes of television, and this is something that, you know, has is, is gone on to become a beloved show. But even before that, you know, most people would say, okay, if you're not going to go with a veteran, maybe you're going to go with an up-and-comer TV director, mm -hmm. and obviously you suit the bill for that. But, you know, it's not like sex education had fight scenes or special effects going on in yeah. it. So, <laughs> so I mean, just talk us through the process of what it was like and, and put us in the room of your final meetings or your first meetings. Yeah, so I think for me, so basically as a writer, I've, I've always like written genre. And the problem I was always having was when I was, you know, trying to pitch my scripts as a writer director, people would be like, this is really cool. But like, we don't know you can direct like, you know, as you're kind of alluding to like fight scenes, big scale sci-fi, because that's kind of what I love writing. And people are like, we don't know if you can do this. So we could like buy it from you, but someone else would have to direct it. Right. And I was like, oh, but I don't want to do that. So like, and I remember just thinking, I, I loved working on sex education because I, I do have a background in comedy. You know, I know a lot of comedians in England. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm good with character and I'm good with comedy and drama. And for me, always the ama the best genre films anyway are always character first, you know, and they, that's what draws you in into the fantastical world. So, but I love Loki. And basically I found out they were making a show about him. And so I just asked my agent, I was like, please just call them every single day. Uh, and just eventually they'll be like, okay, fine. We'll meet her just if you stop phoning us. <laughs> and like, and go. so, yeah. And so I basically, I had an initial Skype with uh, Kevin Wright and Stephen Brassard, who are two executives at Marvel. And I remember I was told it was like a friendly meet and greet and it was just going to be very chill and I didn't need to prepare like a pitch. And I basically ignored that. And I, I didn't have my pitch like, like glossy or in my like uh, PowerPoint presentation yet, but I had all my reference images. And I remember just bombarding them with reference images. We were on a Zoom and I was like, yes, I'm thinking this for like the look of the TVA. And I'd send them like 50 images. And like, I remember that it ended up, I think it was supposed to be like a 30 minute conversation. And it ended up becoming like this three hour kind of discussion. And so I, I had a few of those like Zooms with them. And then I kind of, I don't know, I kept getting, I guess, beyond each hurdle to the point where I got to like, you know, the big pitch to Kevin Feige and the team at Marvel. And that was wild. I remember they flew me over there and yeah, it was very surreal. What, what year was this? <laughs> um, So that was 2019. So that this was all happening, I think, across July or maybe the end of June into July. And then basically I got the job in August because that's when D23 happened. And I think oh, that was very quick. So, wow. but yeah, but the, the pitch was really fun. And I, and like I said, I just figured, I, I know I don't have the experience on some of this stuff, so I'm not going to pretend I do, but I love sci-fi and I love genre and I love Marvel and hopefully my enthusiasm and just also my take on it would be strong enough in the sense of being clear and confident in my vision. So they were like, well, she's not, you know, and the thing is I felt like, well, if they can surround me with the team, I can bring it. And also I know I can do that stuff. I've just not, it's like a lack of um, 
opportunity right and not a lack of want so I think right. for me that was really big was just that's why I did such a big presentation because I, I spoke about fighting I think there's some directors probably that would just be like well I'm just not going to include the stuff that's like my weak spot but I was like I'm just gonna go for it because it's probably I think that's just my personality as well <laughs> like TMI and I was just like look I haven't done a lot of fight scenes but here are some here are some fighting styles that I love and I think this could be cool for Sylvie and this could be cool for uh, Loki and like with the special effects like I had like Minority Report for example I had this little um, special effects reel I cut together and Minority Report I had as a reference because I felt like in episode one the memories we see that Loki watches I felt you know as I think when they were written it almost felt like we went full screen with them and I felt like though the the idea was really interesting to me but I was like I think we should keep us in the room with Loki and I love that moment in Minority Report you know where he sees that hologram of his wife because it's so tragic because she's life-sized and you almost feel like he could reach out and touch her but she's not there and I, I kind of was inspired by that with Loki and the idea that he's most watching like a, a play of his life on stage. So yeah. that, that's kind of what I was doing and trying to use other movies to sort of explain how I would approach it. No. And that's, that's great. And you know, when I talked to Michael about it, about writing it, you know, <laughs> defending your life, you know, mm -hmm. came up as, 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 as a way, cause they're mm -hmm. watching films of their life in that. So yeah. I, I, I really love that too, but going back a second, just cause you said something, you know, you were talking about <laughs> how you would show the TVA, so does that mean they gave you a brief synopsis before the meeting? Because nobody would know that the TVA was going to be a part of the Loki show. So, I mean, obviously yeah. you had something that you knew to prepare for that they that they told you. What was their basic pitch? So I had basically episode one, like an early draft of that and an okay. early draft of episode two, I think. And then that and then I think they told me about the rest of the show on that initial meeting. Got it. So okay. I knew. Yeah, so I kind of already had those first two scripts, so I came ready with stuff for those first two episodes. And and by the time you started production, I was going to ask this later, but I'll ask it now. Did, were all the scripts completed by the time production began? Um, no, we were definitely still writing them. I think basically episodes one and two and three um, were earlier drafts. So basically when I joined, we did essentially, like I guess, like a mini writer's room. So it was like me, Michael, Eric Martin, Alyssa, Kevin Wright and there were just certain aspects like for example the TVA all being variants was something we cracked there the opening of episode four with Sylvia as a child um there was lots of things I think like little details across it obviously they had like the spine of the show but it was just kind of I guess like thoughts that I'd brought as I'd been reading them with fresh eyes and and just the nature of it you know I think episode one I remember was quite far along but there was like just like with every script, right? You just, you're always honing it in and getting it as close as you can. And we also like, I work quite close with the cast in terms of table read and rehearsal. And we did a lot of reads, you know, cause we didn't have our cast yet either when I joined. And so once we had our cast in place, I'd always do like read throughs and the writers were there just because, you know, if you have someone like Owen Wilson, he's going to, on the day he'll throw stuff in, but also just he's going to bring something to it when he's reading it. So we were always refining them in that sense as well. Um, episode five and six was more just in terms of writing. Like we actually worked on those a lot during the lockdown because obviously in the middle of filming, we got shut down for four months. I was going to so ask about that. So, so, so yeah. you had basically a break to kind of at least retool a little, look at your edit, go through what you already had. And then so yeah. you filmed the last two episodes during the pandemic. Is that right? Yeah. So we filmed, basically we had bits we had a few bits in episode two, all of most of episode three and uh, and four, there were bits. But basically, we'd filmed a lot of the stuff in the TVA pre-pandemic. And then post-pandemic, there was a few bits to pick up in the TVA that were across the earlier episodes. And then, yeah, and then the majority, obviously, all of episode five and six and bits of four, most of four, I'd say, actually, yeah. Okay. And, and was that a plan all along? We, 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 was to just shoot out all the TVA stuff so that you're using those sets and those extras at once. So you're kind of shooting out of order the way they do on a film, even though it's a TV show. Is, was that basically the plan if the pandemic didn't happen? Yeah, I think basically that I just in terms of production. Yeah, like we kind of would film the TVA and also because we needed the space because we only had yeah. so many stages. And, you know, we had to build like the void and build Cheru for episode three. So. Yeah, so I think that was definitely sort of in the planning, basically. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that I like to do in this podcast is talk about the creative habit. So I'm going to ask you a question about your creative habits as a director. Um, so a director prepares, right? That's, that's the most mm -hmm. important thing. Talk about your love of using 
storyboards, which I'm sure you did as a film mm -hmm. student, and then how that accelerated by the time you're using all this fancy technology of animatics and pre-visualization and everything else. Yeah, and this one's really cool for me because I actually I listened to the podcast, so <laughs> like I was like, I know the creative habit question. <laughs> Wait, so, so you were a listener. Were you, were you a listener before you directed? Yeah, I think because when I was temping, I remember weirdly for some reason there was I, I think the another Earth one, and that might have been one of the first ones I listened to. With but Bill I remember Marley. I was yeah, but I remember I was so excited because you know, she spoke again about, I think there's that thing, right, as a filmmaker, you almost feel like people come out ready-made when you, and, and most of the time in press, they just talk about, like, the show, and I'd always be like, but how? How did you get there? How did you get the seat at the table, man? I need to know. So yeah. I think that was always really helpful and inspiring to me was just hearing about, you know, like you asked me earlier, like, odd jobs that people did and how, like, yeah, like, even after I did the Idris Elba thing, I was, like, you know, back to temping. Like, it wasn't like I was suddenly a filmmaker. So I always think that's really important to sort of demystify a little bit because directing Absolutely. is a sort of mysterious job to get into. But Yeah, and you did the anyway. right thing by, by continuing to work and continuing to temp and, yeah. you know, pursuing your dream. But that's that's awesome that you were a podcast listener before your your first big gig. And so yeah. I, think, I think this <laughs> makes you the 28th person that's gone from being a listener before they were working in the industry to being in the podcast. So you're 28, madam. Uh, congrats on that. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> happy to have you. And by the way, the Brit Marling story is always amazing because, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you remember, not only did she have Another Earth at Sundance that year, she also had Sound of My Voice, two mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. movies at Sundance. Nobody knew who they were, and they were both like just fantastic genre films. If, if anybody's listening to this yeah. that has not seen Another Earth, or Sound of My Voice, please go check it out. Or the Netflix series, The OA. But I know we're getting way off topic. So tell me about going from being a film school student to being able to play with all these big, fancy toys as a director yeah. to help you know get your vision on paper or digitally sound before you walked onto the set. I mean, it was amazing because I, I remember like in my shorts, like I'd always try and do storyboards. Like I, I remember that the short film I made with Sophia, uh, Smith, for example, I remember I had this like Jeff Goldblum action figure and I made like this kind of hospital room out of paper, basically. And I made like a little mini kind of film and storyboard using that. So I suppose that's probably the closest I'd done to making an animatic. But the amazing thing on Marvel was I remember saying to them, oh, can I get a storyboard artist? And Martin Mercer like was our main artist. We had various ones across some of the action sequences. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. Martin Mercer? Yeah. 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 I know Martin Mercer. He's amazing. Really? Yes. Oh, that's so cool. God, why didn't I look it up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, he, Martin Mercer and I worked, like, I directed video games at a film school, and Martin <laughs> Mercer had done films before, but <laughs> Martin's the best. I love Martin Mercer, yeah. and, and, he's, and he's British, so you guys probably yeah. got along wonderfully. <laughs> he was amazing, and, like, it was so funny because of, because of COVID, I ended up having to storyboard even, like, smaller scenes that you wouldn't necessarily always board because my first AD needed to know how many background do we need? And is there ways that we can kind of cheat it? Maybe you could move this person here or this person here because everyone's trying to get an idea of what we could do in terms of social distancing. So he ended up storyboarding with me, like I'd say like 90% of the show. Like it was bananas but yeah but it was so much fun working with him and I think it really helped me because like Autumn and me the DP we definitely were aligned in our tastes but we hadn't worked together so it was a really good chance as well for us to kind of almost start feeling out or oh, how do we want to cover the scenes? How do you want to do the show? So I think that was really helpful for me. And then, yeah. And then obviously the amazing thing is with Marvel, you then have this amazing previous team who were put together like for the action sequences and the CG sequences. And it was particularly helpful because some of it we did in pre-production and we planned it out quite thoroughly. Like for example, Sheru, that was heavily prevised like before we filmed that because we had to be very precise. Whereas stuff like, uh, okay. So like episode five, the opening of five um, with the twisty camera. Yeah. Can I talk about, yeah, at this point it, it won't spoil anything. Yeah. yeah that's friends. fine. It's okay. Um, so the twisty camera, basically that always planned to go through the TVA into the timekeeper's head, but then it used to go to the courtroom with Sylvia and Renslayer, and it just, in terms of that kind of that X-Files, like excitement before, like going to the Loki title kind of thing we're going for, it just wasn't having the punch we were after and we'd hoped it would have had. And so in the edit, I was like, okay, well, I had this cool shot that introduced the void where I knew I wanted to like, you know, push through the city and then reveal Loki on the ground. And originally when we filmed that on the crane, 
that was just like a big wide shot pushing in on Loki. So I sort of connected that shot to pushing through the city, which we did with the uh, previous team. And then I asked that they could add in, this is just the joy of working with Marvel. I said to the previous team, could you add in a crane shot where it feels like the, the shot's continuing and we're craning above Loki to reveal the monster. So that wasn't planned initially. We sort of found that in the edit. And obviously when you're doing that with the previs, it's also because it's a very expensive shot. So you yeah. have to present it as the previs and then if it gets, you know, the thumbs up, then obviously we take it to the um, VFX vendor and they bring it to life. But yeah, but I think that was something I found that was amazing because it meant you could keep working and keep I think it, particularly with CGI, like in, in Lamentus, for example, like transitional shots, you know, before Sunrise was a reference for us, but I always wanted to make sure I could show the passage of time and it had this kind of Western quality to it. So like that was something we all spoke about a lot. So I think with those guys, when we were building the cut of that, it was really interesting, right? Because most of that episode, our characters are against blue screen. So, you know, we're kind of, we had a bit of set, but not a lot. And I think for us, that was like one of the biggest challenges and something that they also do is they add backgrounds in for you on those blue screen like scenes, just so you have a sense of geography so you can get a pace in the edit and everything else. So no, it was definitely like a massive learning curve for me, but I was very spoiled for sure in terms of what we were about to achieve. So well, that's awesome. And, you know, I, I talked to a lot of filmmakers about how much they get to rehearse. And I think it's great that you did a lot of table reads. I, I Of course, you would be doing that during the pandemic as well when people were spinning their wheels. That makes sense. But what, what were some of the things of value that kind of you got out of the table reads still in the non-spoiler section? But was, was it really kind of like the camaraderie, like sensing basically people's connections to each other and their chemistry? Yeah, I mean, for me, rehearsal is so... I, I do a lot of rehearsal because I think for me, it's the one time when you can work with your actors and you're not surrounded by hundreds of people. So it can also sometimes, depending on the actor, it can be a time for them to play and experiment if they want to try something out with the characters. And not all actors like rehearsal, but I find it really helpful. And I think it can help build chemistry between actors and also just getting their input on the script, you know, because like Tom was an executive producer... And so he would be like, oh, this line is cool, but I've actually just kind of written these few lines that I think could be interesting. And then they would kind of work the way into the script because he obviously knows Loki better than anyone. And I think that was fun. And for the writers, it was fun because, you know, Eric was there when we rehearsed it. And, you know, Eric Martin was our production writer, sorry. And But it was great for him because, you know, we'd cast these characters, but I think it's like once you hear the actors it almost like they have another evolution right and how a, an actor talks it you obviously want to honor what's on the page but it has a natural evolution that it will tweak slightly so it would inspire him as well and he'd be like oh i could do this change or this change and like yeah so i think it was definitely it was very helpful early early on i think definitely and just getting ready to film but i'm yeah i'm always very i love rehearsal that, so that's awesome and i i think rehearsal is great too it's it's weird though because some actors hate it so it's like i yeah you know it's it's always strange and by the way some directors hate it like I get, <laughs> I get that a lot too. So it's, it's, it's always interesting. Yeah. I, I think, I think it's a good idea. Um, if, if the pandemic didn't happen, what was your, what was your typical allotment of days per episode for shooting you know, oh. a TV episode? Or I, I know everything got thrown in, in, in the tornado of the pandemic, but was there ever a plan or, or since you were going back and forth with, mm -hmm. we're going to shoot out this location and stuff like that, maybe that kind of messed that up. Well, the thing is, we didn't film it like an ordinary TV show. So basically, when we were filming, we weren't doing it like episode by episode. It was scheduled like a film in the sense okay. that, you know, we were shooting out locations, but I would be shooting something from like, I mean, not at the beginning. It tended to lean more towards one, two and four because five and six were still in the works. And obviously, we knew six was going to mainly take place in the Citadel. Um, but you know, I'd be shooting like a scene from episode four and then a scene from episode one in the morning. But I mean, that was okay, awesome. Okay. But that, yeah, but the TV thing about it was we were not on a film schedule because obviously on a big film schedule, you film maybe, I don't know, three pages, four pages a day, maybe, probably less, depending if it's a big sequence or not. But on this, we were with TV. So we were filming like five to six pages, sometimes more wow. <laughs> like on a day. It was pretty tight. And the time theater scenes, we had to do even more. But yeah, so it was definitely a challenge in that way because we're filming it in that conventional TV kind of time, 
but you want to bring kind of you still want to I mean, you know marvel they really wanted to make sure that like the scale and the event of seeing one of their movies was still in the tv show so there was a lot of balancing to do to you know bring that quality to it being, being able to bring it together as to how many days the loki season one took how many days would you say if you were able to give us a schedule oh gosh i can't even remember i mean we started filming i'm trying to remember now I don't even remember the exact amount of days, but I think we started nice. filming in February and we maybe, f- oh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess it was the same schedule as one of their movies, like in okay, terms okay. of month, in terms of days, but it's just the amount of pages we did per day was Got way it. more. That's no, the best that way I can sense. describe that it. Sense. So a couple months, you know, one of the last yeah. questions before we get into uh, the spoilers, a lot of, a lot of directors, you know, especially, newer directors as they get into action sequences they rely on their second unit stunt coordinators and action directors but there's there's often a demarcation line in which sometimes mm-hmm. in certain moments of an action sequence with a-list talents certain shots would be directed by the director not the stunt mm-hmm. crew or, or not the second unit director how did that work for you so i would say that generally how we balanced it was that we would always film as much of the action as we could um, in terms of like a pass because Tom did so many of his own stunts. So we always covered it with like our like main actors basically. And then usually we tried to cover as much as we could. And then essentially it was usually just schedule, you know? So like once this, if we couldn't stay there, Monique, who was my stunt coordinator and second unit director, she would stay behind and then pick up bits with, you know, the stunt doubles. But in terms of planning it, like it came out of storyboards, it came out of stunt viz and talking with Mo and talk. Um, and we just share scenes that we we're inspired by for the scenes. Um, you know, like Sylvie, for example, I love the idea of her fighting a bit more, like a bit rough and ready, like kind of like she was like a feral cat, which I quite liked, like because, you know, Loki grew up in a palace and his fight, the way he fights is very balletic and it's very elegant. Whereas like Sylvie, yeah, you know, she's grown up in apocalypses. So she's going to approach a fight in a very different way. Well, that makes sense. Of course. A couple questions. Just again, logistics. How many cameras were you generally shooting with? Um, so we always generally shot with two cameras. But obviously when we did some of the action sequences, it multiplied a bit more. I think the most we had going, but generally it was always two. I think the most we might have had was three at one okay. point. But yeah, we, we didn't end up shooting with a ton. I mean, two is pretty standard for TV, really. So Okay, and I'm just going to talk for one second about the look of the finale without giving away anything about it because we're not in the spoiler section yet. We'll be there in a second. But um, there's so much light going on in in that in that one particular room that they're having a lot of discussions. Yeah. I mean, it's going red, yellow, green, purple, lots yeah. of purple. And it, it looked beautiful. And so I know that when you're shooting on green screen, to get those lights on people's costumes, skin tones, parts of the actual mm-hmm. real set, you've got to be playing with that on your set. So was that yeah. complicated for you? Cause, cause, or, or, or was it just a sense of you knew what your palette was going to be, mm-hmm. you knew that there was an ethereal, ever-shifting look to it, and so you just kind of, I'm guessing, were blending lights on set in front of a yeah. green screen? Is that how it worked? Well, yeah. And I'd also say for that set, it was quite a big um, practical set, that one in particular. So it was only really behind one of the characters. We had that big window. Yeah. But behind like, you know, Loki and Sylvie, it's only if I shot upwards that you'd go into kind of CG land. Yeah. But other, but there actually wasn't a great deal of blue screen on that set, actually. Okay. Um, so I think that helped us in that sense. But yeah, I think it was more complicated really when we were you know, making cuts because obviously, you you know, we have to shift stuff slightly sometimes in the grade just because, you know, the like light might be acting. the color and yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's just, I was impressed because it's complicated because that's a commitment. Like once you're committing to recording yeah. shifting lights like that, there's no way back. And there was a zero cheese look to it. I mean, it looked beautiful. It wasn't like it wasn't like I thought you had club lights like going back and forth uh-huh. or something like that. And and I was just I was just curious, like knowing that there was at least a blue screen or green screen somewhere, like what the challenges mm-hmm. were. But okay, enough of this logistics stuff. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get into the spoilers now. So so podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify, Zoomcast watchers of the Backstory Magazine Zoomcast page. Um, where you could see Kate and I talk because we are going to get into the spoilers and jump around as much as we want. And so here we go. You know, I'm going to start with an easy one just because you were there for the initial discussions. I asked Michael this too. I'm just curious what you remember. Obviously, when Red Skull 
touches the Tesseract in Captain America, the first Avenger, he disappeared. And years later, we learn that he's the guardian in Avengers Endgame, and he's basically the keeper of, you know, the whole Soul, Soul Stone area. Loki, the god of mischief, different, because he's, he's, he's not a human like Red Skull was. Um, he picked it up, and a million different things could have happened. He could, mm-hmm. but he's not enslaved by it. And, you know, the expectation was the possibility of something magical. And I just thought mm-hmm. it was interesting that he ends up in Mongolia and, <laughs> in, in, in an undis- undeclared time zone. It's not clear if it was the same time or previous mm-hmm. future, whatever. What were some of the other variants? I'm sorry to use that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what were some of the other things that you guys played with of where Loki would be going from Avengers Endgame before your mm-hmm. series starts, before the TVA shows up? Because it's just always interesting to hear those kind of ideas. Yeah, so I think that it was... It was always intended that he'd be using the Tesseract to like travel somewhere. So it was always using it to go to a destination. So really the main thing that shifted for us was the destination where he landed. I think initially it was an alien planet in the very early draft of the script um, on a mountain, I believe, like a snowy mountain, I think. And I can't remember. I remember that shifted. We ended up shifting it. Um, I think we wanted it to be somewhere earthbound. I think that's how we ended up changing from that. And then we kind of went through quite a different, a few different locations. And then Kaz were actually my production designer. Cause I think the main thing was, you know, the show has scale and we wanted it to kind of begin with that big scale. And we were talking about Lawrence of Arabia and obviously it's a different place and on earth, but just the idea of a desert. And Kazra was like, what about, you know, the Gobi Desert? Because also that ha- we haven't seen that a lot in cinema. And I was like, oh, that'd be so interesting and just unexpected. And again, we could do these beautiful, big wides of the desert. So that's kind of how we got to there. And yeah. And, and then, like I said, the story mechanic of it was just always that he was going to use the Tesseract to sort of, you know, get away and end up somewhere far away from New York. So that's awesome. And, you know, just while we're on this, it's always fun to hear about left turns. So what were some of the things that you were maybe doing storyboards of, doing animatics for, things that you were convinced were going to be a part of the show that just because of time or budget or just a course correction in the story, you guys abandoned? Because it's always interesting to hear about those early iterations and then how they led to other things. Yeah, so I, I would say like Throg of Thunder, like um, he was in the script in episode one um, and we did like animatics and like we were filming it, but it's just, and I did film the scene, but it, we, we never finished it, but it's just, it was such, it was really, really big heightened comedy. And I think because initially like our early versions of the script, we were leaning more in the comedy world. And I think something we were finding, like once we, you know, cast Owen and Tom was like, oh, the drama in this situation is actually really rich. So we were kind of balancing it out. And it just, that scene ended up being right before Loki sees his mother die. And it just felt like it was taking away, like, sorry, from that moment. So we were like, well, we can't, we can't, it it just unfortunately wasn't going to work there painfully because it was so fun to have that cameo. And that's why that ended up going into episode five, because I had that shot built in episode five where I knew, I, you know, you go through like the lair and we go through the dirt. And I in my head, I think I was almost like insert Easter egg. And I, I was like, I'll work out what we can put there. And then I thought, well, let's put Throg there because we had to take him out of episode one. So and I recorded Chris, obviously, for the voice. So I was like, well, let's a little let's move him there and in a way i think it actually works better in episode five because it's so fun right it's all these oh, things yeah. i haven't seen from the comics and they've all been sent to the void so i think it kind of found the right place for it and then meant that the moment with frigga had the impact it should have as well i, I was dying with the thanos copter because i i do remember yeah. that from the from the comics <laughs> yeah. dying. Were, were there any easter eggs while you're on it that you wanted or you guys thought about and then you're like oh my god this is too obscure we don't need it we have too many like anything that was on the the void of the Easter okay. eggs. Weirdly, I don't think so. Okay, but okay. I remember that we did at one point in episode three, though, we had this like big train crash in episode three that was really cool and was in the script. But we just weren't able with all the it sounds wild, right? With the actual what we were doing in the show. But it's just obviously like you always have there's a cap to the budget. And we just were like, we can't do this with the time and the schedule. And then COVID thrown in, it just became very complicated. Yeah. But I remember we had this crazy scene when we had these bandits riding like these emu kind of alien creatures. And like, yeah, so those emus like went to the void, I guess, in that way. But yeah, but no, honestly, most Easter eggs. 
I think they got through. Like we were pitching stuff and like even though the void turkeys we call them, which are well actually we call them Navas, because my production designer Kazra he was pitching the idea of them because we were trying to find things to be surreal in the void. And he, he, he kind of was like, what about these kind of like weird, surreal, like Alice in Wonderland kind of creatures. And there's like a little ecosystem for them. And I was like, Oh, that's so fun. And his illustrator had like put something together. And yeah, so we named them Narvas after his daughter, but that was one thing that all of us were like, well, the studio are going to obviously tell us we we can't do this because we found them really funny, but they're so weird. And somehow it got through the gates. I still can't believe they're in the show, but I, I love them. I think they're excellent. But That's, um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love hearing about yeah. stuff like that. You know, rules are important <laughs> and you, you're setting a lot of rules about your universe. Uh, obviously, the mm-hmm. writers were doing this as well, but it's up to you to yeah. execute them. What What about something complicated that has a visual simplicity, like just one of the time bombs. Mm. What was your complication yeah. of saying that? Because I, I've seen a few people debate, is it destroying an entire timeline or just the last 20 minutes in this timeline when a variant appeared? And so talk about that because it's it's an early rule that's introduced in the series that I thought was, you know, mm. makes it easy to jump around a lot and screw around a lot having a quote unquote time bomb. So tell yeah. us the challenges of developing that. Yeah, so I think, the big thing was working with Russell Bobbitt, um, who basically makes, who's made so many amazing props basically across Marvel. I mean, him were talking about it and I think it was about just giving it logic, right? So we felt like the bit you see them twist at the top, that almost sets the amount of space that it will cover. And right. I think I, 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 at some points I had added shots where, you know, like in Ren Faire, you saw the tent get deleted and then it got replaced. So basically, yeah, I, I had this bird's eye shot that we'd done previous for, of like the whole tent being deleted. And then it was like, is it replaced by another tent? Or a, And then I think in the end, we were like, this is getting very complicated. But in terms of what we wanted to show and how me and the team understood it was that, yeah, it's deleting, like not necessarily, it would delete a whole time, like a whole timeline if it was the branch was so big, it had to be brought back down. But I think in the end, Miss Minutes animation is the best way to describe it. You know, like it's almost like a, a ripple effect, I guess. Like if it, it kind of covers that ripple effect and how far the branch has gone and then resets it to where it should be. So I think that was the idea with the reset charges. And, and so we were like, okay, no, let's just try and keep it as simple as we can because... I think the idea was that, yeah, it was meant to be a targeted area with those reset charges, and but it covers a bigger space. And then the logic we brought to the time stick was, that's more like, I don't know, if I wanted to delete just my cup, I could just touch it. But just simple things like color, like when Loki gets hit around the face, that would be purple. Whereas for deletion, we'd go for amber, just so you kind of, you know, knew the different rules of the time sticks. And I remember at one point, like the we had the the collars obviously which were really fun but the twister was like a separate thing and we had just all these different bits of technology and so me and him I remember we were talking about it and we were like well let's just attach it to the temp pad because then it's I, for me I was like well for blocking that's great because then they can just pull it out and they can reattach it and so it was kind of almost really digging into the weaponry and how that made sense so it could be clearer to the audience basically how this new tech worked I guess one of the other things to talk about is did you ever think about showing a little more of like you know why different variants were pruned like you know Ravona the scene doesn't end and then Sylvie she's playing with figures but we don't know really why she's taken away unless it's because she was a female Loki or you know that was it so did was there ever any talk about that as as kind of stuff on the side or was was that just getting too much of you know a branch away from the main story not to again use a bad part (laughs) I think honestly, it was just about for Sylvie, for example, I think because episode four, the whole thing was shifting audience POV from thinking the TVA could be heroes, but oh, are they? I don't know. There's 1984 posters everywhere. Like, I don't know. Do I trust these guys? And then delivering on actually there's something a bit more sinister going on here. So when, you know, we get the rug pulled, the timekeepers, it's almost like some of the audience are catching up, but some of them are kind of there. And I think that was the thing with Sylvie that was important to me. And you get a slight hint of it in the Miss Minutes video in episode one, because, you know, our poor cartoon man that steps off his timeline, it looks like he's just walking in the wrong direction. And then he ends up in the TVA and, you know, gets pruned, which is basically deleted from time. And so I think that was the key thing with Sylvie was that, I thought it was way more painful that it wasn't such an active decision, you know, like Loki still that Tesseract, does he know the TVA are going to come? No, but it's a very active right. thing he does. Whereas Sylvie, 
she's just a child. And I think that was really important was because I, I wanted to film that moment as well, where she goes through the TVA in a similar way to when Loki goes in there. But tonally, it's a completely different tone. And it's way more scary seeing it through the eyes of a child and also an innocent child. You know, she hasn't yeah. done anything wrong. And I think we never really wanted to completely underline what her Nexus event was but just more that it was coming from a place of pureness. I mean, it could be from the fact that she was good or, you know, picked up the wrong toy. It could be something as small as that. And I think that was important to show with the TVA is that it isn't always a giant thing, you know, that you have to do to be arrested by them. So then it kind of feeds into the debate of, oh, you know, are these good guys, are these bad guys? So Yeah, look, I, identity is really important in, in television and movies. And, and something that I was really impressed about is, you know, just early on in Loki's case file, his sexuality is listed as fluid, which is definitely correct for the character, but I just didn't know if that was going to come across in the show. And, you know, in, in episode three, it was a big deal that essentially Loki becomes the first bisexual character in the MCU. And for LGBTQ plus folks, that's a big deal of having those, those moments of identity. Now, now, you know, Fans know that Valkyrie, uh, you know, Tessa Thompson had a deleted scene from uh, Thor Ragnarok that, you know, indicated that she, Valkyrie was bisexual, but but it, it, it hit the cutting room floor. So so tell us kind of the behind the scenes of finding out a way that was acceptable for, uh, you know, a company like Disney and Marvel. These are big companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still finding our footing on how to present identity through major corporations so tell us what the what the mm -hmm. challenges and and of course the the victories were because because i thought you did a, a great job of making a really nice first step yeah i think for me so like you know i'm queer and i wanted to acknowledge these aspects of his like you know his identity but also his sexuality as you know separated but i just wanted to acknowledge those because as you said like i feel like it it's something though that i must say was it you know, I, I when I came in, I said to them, are we going to talk about it? Because, you know, in the comics, it's canon, you know, that he's gender fluid, but also that he is bi. And he's also been written as pan, I should also say. But I just wanted, you know, the show's about his identity. So I was like, can we acknowledge these in some way? So I think there was definitely in the team, they were like, yes, we want to do that. And there was goodwill to do it. I think it was more just... Um, they wanted to do it in the right way and be very mindful about how, you know, just they wanted to get it right in that way. And I think for me, I was really proud to be part of this step because it's really interesting for me, right? Because I was like, in some ways, you know, for example, when Loki, we acknowledge that he's bisexual, sorry, bisexual, <laughs> is that it almost feels like a small step because it's a line of dialogue. But at the same time, I was like, well, no, it's actually a massive step because, you know, you know, as you said, like the companies that are behind it, but also like online, like I, I was really touched because, you know, I got messages from people saying, you know, I know you said it's a small step, but in the country I'm in, this is huge <laughs> to see this on a TV show here. And like someone's parent got in touch with me saying that their daughter was able to kind of come out to her and talk about how she felt. And I, I think for me, I felt like, well, you know, like if little Kate had seen that, it would be very big for me. So I, I just kind yeah. of felt like, you know, I was happy to be part of that. And like I said, I must stress it. It was important to me, but it was important to the whole team. Like, you know, Marvel, Disney, Michael, the actors. Like, we just wanted, I think the main thing was really just making it fit in our story. So I think that, yeah, I was just proud to be part of it, to be honest. I'm just rabbiting on now. I mean, it, it, <laughs> yeah. was, it was a big first yeah. step. I hope I, hope I didn't mm -hmm. start minimizing it because I was really impressed. No, no, it's how I talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it is massive. I should be, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> and kudos again to you because... Aside from the people that identify in that fashion, the more important ripple effect, as, as we talk about these things, is the people that don't. And seeing that this is a yeah. normal, everyday part of their universe, and these are people yeah. too, and they shouldn't be considered others. I'm terrified to ask this. And if you can't name a country or something like that, that's fine, but more of a yes, no. Were there any countries that you had to cut that reference out for? And it's okay if you can't name them. But I know in some countries in the world, even talking like that or insinuating yeah. like that is not allowed. No, it's an interesting question. I mean, as far as I'm aware, no. Like the okay. edit okay. that we sent out is the edit that's across Disney Plus everywhere. Great. Um, that's great. Yeah, I don't think so. Now, um, now taking yeah. this to another level, taking this to another, le another mm -hmm. level, and I'm just curious if this was mm -hmm. even a 30-second possibility. Mm-hmm. 
when you talk about Loki as being bi and stuff like that, one way to ease, for lack of a better way to say it, the general public into it is mm-hmm. the, the self-love aspect that he has between himself and Sylvie. But mm-hmm. I'm curious if there was ever anything on the table where the Loki self-love concept could have originated between two male identifying versions of Loki rather mm-hmm. than Loki and a female identifying version or presenting version. Was, that, was that ever on the table or was it just really always going down male, female for at least the self-love aspect? Um, well, when I joined the project, it was, it was, that part was pretty set that, you know, okay, he okay. would meet a female version of himself and that they would fall in love and that, you know, I, I interpreted it as self-love and that was kind of my interpretation of it. But I suppose on the other hand, there's also that thing of, you know, he's bi, right? So he dates like, you know, multiple genders. So yeah, so I didn't, for me, feel like it was erasing that aspect of his personality. I think it was more for us, like, yeah, but no, in terms of, I, I have no idea. You'd have to ask Michael, to no, be honest. Cool. I, I, I was just curious because, um, like, fitting into that, that's that a would good be question. Like a, It'd be cool, but that yeah. Would be a big, that would be a big yeah. step. And Sylvie <laughs> obviously was an easier way for for general audiences, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. to palatably sell it. Um, but I would have been just as happy if it, if it you know, mm. was, a, was a male identifying version or male presenting version. Mm. Um, I love the concept of self love as an egoist. What were what were some of the, the discussions that you had? Because it's just it's really funny because, of course, who else could Loki love but himself if he's open finally to love? So tell us about yeah. some of those conversations. I think it was interesting, right? Because like on the one hand, like I remember saying, I think I even said something similar in my pitch to what you just said. And I was like, of course, who better match for Loki than himself? But at the same time, then it was like, OK, well, that's the initial thought. And I love that Mobius calls it out, you know, in episode four. And he's like, you narcissist, you fell for yourself. But then it was kind of working out, okay, so there's that layer of it. But then at the same time, she is she is a Loki technically, but she isn't him, you know? And I think yeah. that's what was important for us was like that very last line she says to him at the very end of the show, where she's like, well, I'm not you. And I think that was the key thing is like, you know, he even calls her like a faded photocopy, I think, in episode three. But like, she's not a photocopy of him because that in itself is the ego, right? It's like, I'm going to project myself onto you, which I think some people do anyway when they meet someone that isn't obviously a version of themselves right. if they're romantically interested. But I, I think that was interesting for us to kind of delve, delve into is the, you know, nature versus nurture. And like, because she grew up in a palace, but fleetingly, she's been on the run for so long. So how are these Lokis different? And then obviously explored even deeper with the variant Lokis in the void. Like, what are their stories? Where where do their paths cross and then diverge? So, it's mm-hmm. it's it's really fascinating to me, and and it's it's mm-hmm. also really interesting that the the concept here of self love with a variant variant causes a nexus event, and someone will swoop in to stop it. Because you know, in in mm-hmm. episode four, the whole time I was like, okay, you know, what would be classic Loki? Because I was trying to figure out how he was going to get out there, and I absolutely love the fact. That, you know, it seems like they were going to be the roots of what destroyed the spaceship. I thought that Mm -hmm. was just really cool that they were going to be using that power to get out of there. And then there's just that moment where they realize, you know, yes, they're the center of their universe. But a few Mm -hmm. other things might be happening in the universe. And so rocks come and, you know, destroy it as part of, you know, what's happening to that planet. And then I was like, well, how are they going to get out of there? So my my initial Mm -hmm. thought was... Maybe when Loki presented that the time device he had was broken, it was just an illusion, and he was going to mm-hmm. try and keep sweating Sylvie for information. And then at the last uh-huh. moment, used it. but 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 funny enough, <laughs> this concept of self love and a nexus event stemming from something as simple as a kiss that was just wild to me. That like, oh my god, mm-hmm. it's the TVA that swoops in and saves them. What? So, so yeah. what do you remember about that moment at the at the end of that episode? Because I, I thought that was like of all the things that I thought might happen, I I wasn't counting yeah. on that one. Yeah, it was a really interesting one that one because originally that scene was in episode three, and I this was before I joined, but I know when they were in the writers' room for that moment because, like I said, this was always a big moment that they were going to connect at Crater Lake and create this Nexus event, and that that would be like a, you know, a flare to the TVA. And I remember that, I think Michael, I remember saying that him and the writers were talking about, like, oh, should they kiss? Should they not kiss? And I think there was a big debate about that. But I think when I started, it was always a look to each other. And then I remember when I was rehearsing with the actors on the day, 
they did that moment where she kind of puts her, her hand over on his arm. But I think it it doesn't have to, have to even be a physical action. It's just that feeling, right? That they have these feelings that are growing for each other. It could even just be from like their eye contact, like the look originally. And I think that for me, like even when I pitched on the show, because that, like I said, that was very much in the DNA of the show, that moment. And I just thought that was beautiful. I love the idea that it's, you know, these two <laughs> star-crossed variants coming together can bring down this big bureaucratic organization. And at the heart of it, you know, we were really chasing, it's a love story. So I, I think that that for me was really nice in that sense. And we moved it to episode four, partly for structural reasons, because it, we found it more impactful to kind of take their relationship so far end at the arc exploding because it felt like an impactful way to end the episode and kind of let the audience stew in like who are these two characters what do they mean to each other and then the next week deliver on oh no actually there's deeper feelings here because that kind of felt like where we really dug into that so it felt better moving that scene there that make that makes sense and i thought it was great mm -hmm. uh you know just briefly what was your biggest challenge of the whole planet destruction because it mm -hmm. really looked beautiful it was big sci-fi huge hurling rocks coming down raining down on a planet total <laughs> destruction a lot of your budget i would think is kind of going towards that what were some of the challenges of that as as, as such a, a big set piece i remember honestly like early days like because i was cutting like i filmed half of it pre-pandemic and i filmed half post-pandemic when we knew we were putting it into episode four and it's such a weird thing to say, but I think it was a big thing for me, the editors and the sound design team, and also Natalie with her score, was working out because obviously they're in an apocalypse and it's not quiet, it's noisy. There's like meteorites and bits of planet falling down on this moon. But it was knowing, I think at the beginning, it was like, okay, we need to create an atmosphere where it's more about audience POV, right? So it's like you think that you, you get a taste of the apocalypse at the beginning of the scene, but then it's almost like you end up it's, it's how to explain it like two people having an intimate conversation at a concert that's really loud and it's like the rest of the noise drowns out and you're just with these people and I think that was kind of the way we approached it with them and that echoed out to the effects I remember circling so many little meteorites because we sometimes had a few that were you know in the previous added but they'd be exploding behind the actors on a really beautiful line so that in itself was a dance was just rhythmically timing those so the apocalypse still felt present and we did that obviously with Skywalker with the sound design as well was like you know the sounds of screaming but in the distance or just so it was clear where they were so that there was still peril so when you know that big meteorite hits and you think they're going to get taken out by you know like a rogue one kind of wave that it didn't feel like where did that come from but I think honestly that was the biggest challenge with that scene was balancing out the intimacy of it with the as you mentioned the big sci-fi scale <laughs> yeah, I, I love the stuff on lamentus and i thought it looked really beautiful. um <laughs> oh, there, was, there were a lot of really beautiful looks uh you know mm -hmm. i i want to ask really quick just briefly before mm -hmm. we get into stuff with the last two episodes w mm -hmm. was there anything that was kind of integrating with you working at all with either the wandavision team or or any of the other teams that were working on other movies because obviously the way things go in the finale with, with, you know, with Kang the Conqueror will have other implications in the MCU. And so I'm just curious if there was anything you guys needed to be aware of, because one of the things I really like is, you know, for Backstory Magazine, our Black Widow issue is coming out, like, because there's so many spoilers in it. We held it a little to give people a chance to see it. But, you know, in our discussions with Eric Pearson, like, he, he, he really almost talks about the Marvel writing community from movies to tv show as like the old studio staples of mm -hmm. you know the the writers rooms or writer bungalows where people would dip in and, and just assist or advise on other projects mm -hmm. so i'm just curious how much of that you guys had going so i would say like the way we were doing it so generally i i, I can't speak for all of the marvel projects but our pro i think generally they do is so you have a marvel executive so Kevin Wright was, you know, he was with Michael in the writer's room and he'd be pitching in story ideas. Like he was across the story completely. And he was then, you know, when I was there and we were filming, he was with me. Um, but basically he would manage us with that kind of stuff. So they have lots of internal meetings because I think that's the thing with Marvel, like the secrecy is very real. <laughs> so like you only get to find out, I would love to know what the other shows were doing, but we only really got information if we needed to know it, like a need to know basis essentially. Right. Um so he would let us know like if we needed to tweak anything with world building but I think that was also the genius of Marvel and Kevin Feige is that you never feel like restricted as a creative you know and I think that 
that that's kind of how they do it is that they're you know our executives from that like Kevin Wright and Stephen Brassard they were just very working across with us with everything just to you know make sure you know our focus was on our ship but they were making they had obviously they know about all the others <laughs> so they're making do sure you that remember we remember a back. particular thing that they they said you know could you you adjust this just slightly <laughs> I think the main thing, honestly, was like how we were describing in episode six and uh, when, you know, He Who Remains tells the story about isolating the timeline and then also the Miss Minutes video with the multiverse and just making sure that logic tracked. I think that's what yeah. we got, you know, as it's nothing secret. It's just what's in the show. Like right. we're making sure that our logic tracked with what, you know, because obviously that's going to lead to what they're setting up in future projects. I mean, people noticed, or I think they noticed, uh, you could settle the debate, David Lingelm from WandaVision working at the TVA. W what could you tell us about that little piece of crossover, that that actor, that's his name, David Lingelm? Oh, really? I think that, I'm trying to think now, that might have just been, <laughs> that's quite funny. people recognize him with his big mustache. And yeah, I... He's amazing. I'm just, I, do you know what? I think honestly, it was probably just because of where we were filming because we both filmed in the same place. But right. in terms of story, we could say that he was a, a variant, right? Yeah. <laughs> like no, they were taken from the timeline. So, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, but it is like, yeah, that is funny. But I think, yeah, we both filmed in Atlanta and, you know, there's an amazing pool of actors there and he's fantastic. So, yeah, so I think that was kind of a, a happy accident. But then in terms of our story, I'd be like, yeah, he's a variant. <laughs> yeah, you know, stakes yeah. are important. Stakes are important in a movie and or a TV show. And, and obviously here we have that pruning does not equal death. And mm -hmm. it's interesting mm -hmm. to find that out because, you know, you you fear death as a character and yeah. and it's it's a bold hop into the void, you know, and the null at the end. And mm -hmm. it's I'm just curious what your discussions were about that because mm -hmm. it's a big step and even Kang or, you know, he who remains mm -hmm. when they're, when they're talking, um, you know, he says like, if you kill me, I'll be back anyhow. And it's, yeah. it's just, a, it's, it's an interesting circular view. So, I, but there's always gotta be some sort of a stakes. So tell me what your discussions with that were like. I think really, cause I think that was in the original arc of the show, right? When I joined is that, you know, like episode four, I think we always spoke about like our red wedding episode. Cause like, you know, we think Loki's dead. We think Mobius is dead and like the timekeepers aren't real. And like, and I think that was the fun that they, we always knew they were going to the void, which is sort of like, I don't know, the trash can of the TVA. <laughs> and, and it was only there that a lie of the monster could completely, you know, decimate something from reality. So I think that's how we kind of, we knew we were doing that. So I think really the thing for us to manage was, making sure that you know the early deletions and i know it's like pruning deletion i think in my head it's like deletion is actually what's happening and pruning is like kind of the spin doctor kind of term that the tva use with their nice gardening metaphors but right. but i think it was really just about making sure those deaths feel painful right so like when like um uh josh for example who plays like you know our wall street guy who gets deleted in episode one it needed to look really painful and awful. So you're like, oh my God, they just like dusted that guy, <laughs> you know? Cause like, I think that was really important to see, but then obviously I think, so then when we see Loki wake up in episode, you know, well the, the mid credits of episode four and then episode five, when we unravel what's really going on there, it feels again, like another rug pull into like who this organization are. I thought it was really genius, you know, to, to do something that they did here that kind of linked everything together a little for where they're going with the MCU for the moment in which mm -hmm. the TV, the TVA in the comics was, was not aligned as directly with Kang or, or, mm -hmm. or even if we want to keep calling him, he who remains, but, but, but so introducing that was a big leaping off point and connecting those two things to really make sense of where obviously this TV show is mm -hmm. going, but where some events are going to be going. Cause obviously it's in the MCU as well. What do you remember about those discussions? Because because it's really fascinating to me. And, and were you able to cast Jonathan Majors as he who remains? Yeah. So with I would say with the TVA's connection to the character, like because basically it's like Jonathan's obviously playing he who remains, who's like a variant of Kang. So like their connection to that character, obviously, I think honestly that was set in place when I joined, and that was early days. I think with Marvel, okay, like that's just they knew they wanted to set up the TVA and they knew they wanted to kind of connect it to that character at the end. And I think, I know Michael, I think has spoke about this and I definitely have as well. I think both of us were like, 
we get to set up that character. <laughs> We're like, cool, but like, okay. And I think, you know, the writers just kept writing and I was like, cool, let's just move ahead. Like, we're going to do this. And like, obviously we did do it, but I think it, and it's not like the studio weren't certain. It was more just because it's such a big honor, right? To do something right. like that. And I couldn't believe that we were getting to do it. And I was very flattered that we could. And in terms of casting, yes, I did get a seat at the table, so to speak, because obviously it's a massive casting decision for them. So it was, you know, with the studio, but it was also with Peyton, who's doing Ant-Man. And all of us, I think that's the nice thing about Kevin Feige is that, and it invites collaboration, you know what I mean? And I think Michael as well spoke about this. Like it's very, you know, the way what the writers is very collaborative, the way the writers room, you know, I'm sure Michael could speak more to that, but I think it's just, they invite people that are very collaborative and kind of follow that thing of best idea wins. And I think that's definitely like a Marvel way of working. So the fact I can, you could kind of echo that across to this casting discussion because, you know, there's a world where we could, me and Peyton might not have been there. <laughs> It right. could just be decided by the studio because it's a huge decision for them. And But he wanted us there and I was very glad. And yeah, and Jonathan was an actor that just, you know, and Sarah, sorry, Sarah Finn, our casting director as well, was there obviously. And we were all just discussing like actors that we thought could be interesting. And Jonathan was an actor that all of us were just like, you know, wow, he's amazing. And just also he's an amazing character actor. And I think, you know, we know this is going to be a character that has like Loki, like many different variants. So I think... It, it was bringing that idea to that. But I think for me, I was excited to see his take on He Who Remains because he's this really interesting character, right? He's like, there's this balance of the introvert that's like living at home alone, really probably only talks to Miss Minutes. Right. Um, and then the extrovert who's this m amazing showman and has to be so charismatic that in the last episode, this conversation, because it is a conversation that you want to sit there like Loki and Sylvie and be like, okay, what's this guy got to say? <laughs> so I think that, yeah. What I thought was genius about it too was, you know, again, identity. It's, it's you know, you're casting a person of color as, as he who remains, AKA Kang. And on the one hand, some people would, would you know, maybe not an eyebrow, right? And say like, well, is, is there anything in a, comic book film that we could do that's a bit more heroic for a person of color but what's interesting mm -hmm. is he who remains is heroic in 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 this yeah. presentation in which he's trying to keep order in the universe but i'm sure we're mm -hmm. going to learn you know because of king's involvement and 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 the, mm -hmm. the the nature of nathaniel richards if you guys are going to keep it as nathaniel richards um, who went on to different versions of Kang, including Amortis. Like, you know, there's there's good sides of a person and there's bad sides of a person, which is everybody. So it works yeah. as inclusion casting, as, as diverse casting, because, you know, the presentation on Loki is not exactly a villain yet. Villainous or, or a little questionable, some of the decisions, mm -hmm. because it, it is the, the classic debate of free will versus determinism. So, so that is yeah. essentially what's going on, but uh, I, you know, kudos again to you on that. And I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about that final scene because one of the things that again was so great about it, and it's almost like mm -hmm. a callback to Return of the Jedi by the end of it, mm -hmm. in which you know it's Luke and Darth having the battle in front yeah. of the emperors, who's just like, oh my, what's going on here? You know, because because he who remains yeah. is just kind of kicking back because he's presented both sides of the story, and the two Lokis become both sides of the story arguing with yeah. each other. So, so what were kind of the, some of the dynamics you were playing with? Because you, mm -hmm. you as a director have this task of making exposition interesting, which again, mm -hmm. kudos to your team did with the 3d model figurines mm -hmm. that appear on the desk, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's very difficult for, you know, how long in a, in a genre show like this, we're going to stay on an explainer of any sorts face. So, First, you yeah. have the challenge of exposition. <laughs> then you have the character battle of someone having a battle with themselves. Of yeah. Two sides of a coin. So tell us, tell us how <laughs> that all, how you wrapped your head around all that. Yeah. So I would say on like the good and evil side, right? Like he who remains, I think is definitely like the purest, like the goodest. Like you know, I think you you have to really believe him when he says, "Do you think I'm evil? Like wait till you meet my variants." But also when you having that line like we're all villains here is so key to me because normally right it's your two like pure heroes like knights storming the castle but they're not like loki was took out someone's eyeball not very long ago <laughs> and sylvie we've seen it she like killed loads of minutemen and you see the amount of reset charges in rock's cart that's a lot of people that she's killed to like you know make her mission work so i think that's the thing across all the show and like i mean even sylvie and mobius talk about it in the car like you know about the amount of you know 
timelines they've wiped out and i think that was kind of part of the bigger debate in the show so like is someone good or is or are you bad or are we a bit more in between and so there was that kind of debate at the heart of it but in terms of capturing it yes so we had like i remember that when we were thinking about what those should look like it was me and my editor emma basically i remember that we were all discussing it you know across the whole team but it was in post i think to working with uh, the previous team in terms of like what those figures could look like. Because at one point I was like, oh, maybe it looks like a mini time theater kind of hologram. So it kind of echoes back to episode one. But then I was really inspired by like Kazra's beautiful like Citadel. And I was like, well, actually the Tempad, I think it's cool if his Tempad is more futuristic technology because I like the idea that he's given, you know, kind of like version one, <laughs> like, you know, maybe like, I'm trying to think now, like the mini disc to the TVA right. and he's got like the iPod, do you know what I mean? So I think for me, it was like, well, I love the idea that it could be built of this amazing kind of like this meteorite basically, or sorry, asteroid, sorry, that he's on at the end of the show. And I love the idea of that being liquid and then that kind of forming these like beautiful figures because it felt like it fitted in his world but also then it had aspects of the technology, like you see it delete, like we've seen, you know, the visual effect looks like deletion as we've seen it with the TVA, but the tech is more advanced and different. And I think that was the fun thing with those tableaus, honestly, was making them feel graceful and elegant. So it ties into he who remains personality, but also just like, what do we show in those? And I, I think that was something that, you know, me and Emma and the visual effects team were all crafting. And then obviously going back to on set, it's across all departments, you know, it's working with Jonathan, who's a fantastic actor and working on him with the, you know, the blocking. Like I remember that I didn't know he was going to jump up on the desk, for example, but he did that. And I was like, oh, this is genius because it's almost like, obviously when you're filming something that's across multiple locations, your location changes like your breath and your reset. But we had to do that through blocking or camera moves or music because we're in the same place for the whole time. So I loved it when he jumped on the desk because I was like, oh, this is great. We can use his movement then to take us almost onto the next chapter of the story of the, you know, the book we're finishing now. And, and like, for example, Autumn, you know, with the camera, we had a few spots like, you know, where time is, he's in new time. I mean, we knew we wanted to pull back there. And in the moments where we wanted him to be drawing people in, we knew we wanted to push the camera in. But beyond that, it was really like with Autumn and her team, like feeling it out. It was very beautiful, like music almost, you know, like they were looking at what Jonathan was doing and then she would tell him, okay, push in now, push in. And yeah, so I think that was key for us in terms of giving it a bit of pace. And then I'm just trying to think of anything else beyond that. And then Natalie's amazing score as well. Like when is the score like helping give energy to the scene and like drive the story along? And when is it holding back? So no, I said it was yeah, a big was a, group. There's a lot going on because you, you <laughs> yeah. have these three forces of nature coming together and you're right. Yeah. You we're just doing that classic slow creep towards him sometimes and, yeah. you know, giving him an eye line that's just to the left of camera. Like he's not yeah. looking into camera, but it's getting so close. Yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, like it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot of interesting things going on there. Uh, I guess yeah. the endings are important, and crafting that ending. First off, was there any other ending other than that of them ending of of Loki <laughs> being dispelled and ending up into an alternate mm -hmm. universe, which really starts on on you know, like the multiverse concept rather than jumping mm -hmm. forward and backward in one timeline. He's now in an alternate universe where there is a different statue of he who remains rather than mm -hmm. the fake timekeepers that were had statues earlier which which would have required setup and payoff from your end in which you would have needed mm -hmm. to show that shot repeatedly so that when loki steers out the audience realizes mm -hmm. that something's different so just tell us about constructing <laughs> the final twilight zone moment which was really yeah <laughs> well i think that we always knew that loki and sylvie would go to the citadel they would meet he who remains and that the multiverse would be released. But the kind of how that happened, I think we always had the kind of, I remember Michael's like early script always had that like that amazing showmanship and like the casualness when you meet him. And, uh, but I think in terms of like, I remember that we, I can't remember when we got to it, but I remember we came to like Loki and Sylvie having their fight and that almost the red pill and blue pill decision and then both taking one each, <laughs> like, that came we came to that later and I remember then Michael was like oh like we, he then like restructured the ending in that way so we always knew I think that that felt right to us because it then played as well into our love or well, tragic love story that you know it doesn't go well and that it does sever that you know they can't escape who they are and 
I think so that played in that way. But in terms of the final ending, I remember that we we kind of circled a lot of things because I shot that basically from when Loki's in the time theatre and runs for the TVA, like we shot a fair amount of that in additional, like photography, like when we came back much later. Like as a reshoot, think, basically? Um, yeah, basically we were just picking up like little shots at the very end when I'd cut quite a lot of it together. And I think it was honestly just coming out of, we all wanted to stick the landing. And I remember that Michael and Eric, I think, pitched this cool ending with like the Twilight Zone, as you said. And like, oh, I was like, that's like, great. And then I was like, oh, we should reference Planet of the Apes and do like, you know, pushing on him and then reveal it. And I think that was the fun thing for us. And I think also at that point in time as well, obviously, we knew the story was going to continue as well for a season two. So it was like, because we already had questions that we were dangling and leaving, obviously, right. you know everything from like where does Ravona go what's B15's memories like what did she see and like and I think it then felt like oh actually we can give everyone because you know the show had that structural kind of thing of we we leave on a twist or like a, a gut-wrenching like oh my god moment so it felt very in keeping of the tone of the show as well so yeah so I think that that's something we came to later in that sense but I know that once we landed on it everyone was like oh this is awesome this is definitely the way to like finish this show so well, yeah the moment it was original planet of the apes inspired as well obviously because he's looking at the statue of liberty here it's the statue of he yeah. remains so so there's yeah so there. <laughs> oh hey i'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out backstory magazine over at backstory.net you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our ipad app backstory and you know folks if you've never read us before our free issue can be read uh over at backstory.net or via our ipad app and for you Marvel fans, it happens to be our Avengers Endgame issue. So there are a lot of reasons to check out the free issue and see if backstory is for you. And speaking of Marvel again, we are just getting ready to publish our Black Widow issue. We wanted to give people a little bit of a chance to see the movie because we get deep into the spoilers in this issue. And in this issue, you could read about other films and TV shows and comic books as well. So there is a lot to explore at Backstory.net. I hope at the very least you check out our table of contents as we release this new issue issue 44 our black widow issue and uh look you know i want to entice you so of course i'm happy to give you discount coupon code save five that's save and the number five you could use that at backstory.net it will save you five dollars off a one-year subscription to the magazine and give you a chance to explore our back issues a little in our archive that we're adding new issues to as we go backwards in time there and uh of course read the new content that we produce as well and look it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which has all these Zoom casts on it, become subscribers and support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our interview with director Kate Heron about directing season one of Loki. You know, obviously editing is the last stage of storytelling. And I'm just curious, you know, what were the lessons from your editing room? Because Unlike mm -hmm. a regular filmmaker that I would interview who maybe is doing something that is two hours, you know, this is mm -hmm. like five and a half, six and a half hours. You have a lot to keep track of. <laughs> and uh, tell us your lessons from the editing room. Yeah, I think honestly for us, like a big thing was that, you know, the tonal kind of feeling, I think like, you know, like episode one and two, for example, we because we obviously got shut down halfway through filming. So I just started cutting into episode one with the editors and we were like, oh, actually, like the drama here is really strong and leaning a bit more. I think we were always like, oh, how funny or how serious is the show? And well, you know, we had a balance, but I think we ended up finding or actually pushing it more towards drama with relief moments of comedy was where we sort of found our sweet spot. And so that did affect like redrafting like in later scripts later in the show you know with episode five and episode six and I think that kind of helped us and just little little details that the actors did you know little things they would improvise or do and that would inspire ideas in the writing but in terms of the edit I would also say like just moving scenes right like because like we found that ending on the arc actually was more impactful and then we would move crater late to episode four um other things in the edit Oh, I'm just trying to think now because I spoke about the opening of episode five. I mean, okay, so the soundscape at the beginning of episode six. So Eric had this amazing idea that, you know, we could do like an homage to like contact and, you know, we'd move through space. And I remember he, didn't, he had in his script, like we move through space to the end of time and we see the timeline in the Citadel. And then, so I took that to Darren, who's the storyboard artist. And we were, who, who did that particular sequence. 
and we were talking about it and me and him were talking about okay well let's like this is a show about time so visually let's have that sequence play with time and so and also I was like and also I want to have a few MCU nods in there with certain ships we see just so it's got that MCU flavor to it and so visually we started doing that and then Darren had this like amazing idea where he was like oh I think it'd be really cool see what you think if it's like the Citadel it's almost like I think he described it as like a needle on a record player and the record is the timeline. And he was like, what if the timeline is a circle and it's not a straight line? Because obviously everything he'd seen and what we'd done was the writers had this really amazing drawing of uh, basically just to explain like, you know, the main timeline and branches. I remember Michael drew it and I was like, that's what should be on the chrono monitor. Because I remember I was like, I completely understand now how that works. So let's use that image across the show. But then I love the idea that Darren pitched because it made me think of how we used to think the earth was flat. And it's actually now when you get to the end of time, it's actually a circle. And I think it showed almost not how limited the TVA are, but just that they, even they don't have all the information. So with that, we got there. And anyway, I had this idea as we were kind of, it's that shot basically towards as, as you see the physical timeline. I remember saying to like my editor and Kevin Wright, our producer, I was like, oh, we should add in like sounds of earth, like, you know, like a baby crying or the jungle or the city. And they were like, okay, cool. That's interesting. And we took a few quotes from history as well. And it was right. originally, you know, I, I, we turned on, yeah. we turned on closed captioning and, and yeah. watched with subtitles and like Nelson Mandela's in there, Neil Armstrong's yeah. in there and yeah. a few <laughs> MCU characters as well. Yeah. And basically, so that was originally just at the very end and just for like, as I think is basically you start to get the impression you were inside the physical timeline. And then I, I just thought it could be kind of cool. And I think at one point I was like, the rest of it could be silent, which obviously we didn't end up doing. <laughs> but like, but we, but we pitched it to the studio and Kevin Feige, I remember, was like, oh, this is really cool. And he liked the quotes and he was like, you know, we've never put quotes on the logo before. And then we were like, oh my God, that's so cool. And so we ended up doing, like building this bit on the logo. And I should say we... My editor, Emma McCleave, and Sarah Bennett, her assistant, they built it. <laughs> we were all giving ideas and notes, but they crafted this thing. So basically, that in itself felt really beautiful because it was almost like a respectful, like a nice handover to what had come before in the MCU and that we were about to twist it. But then it, it made me, Kevin Wright, my exec producer, and Emma and Sarah, we were all like, oh my God, we should just add the soundscape across the whole thing so that actually ended up happening quite late in the day and it's why I was still working on the show when episode two aired because we were obviously clearing voice rights across the whole thing and we worked with the Disney diversity team as well like in terms of getting all the quotes because we also wanted to be representative so that was like a massive team effort but I think that's a really good example of you know we took a really brilliant idea from the writers and then the whole team were just kind of building upon that like pretty much right up to when I had to like literally the episode got ripped out my hands so yeah but that's how that kind of came to be <laughs> that's that's <laughs> awesome I, I you know I'm curious if there was anything cut in your editorial process that fans would enjoy hearing about it even if it was just a small mm -hmm. scene for timing or a joke or you know obviously no major plot points i don't mm -hmm. think were cut but curious if there was uh, there's definitely like a few scenes here and there like we did titans across it like um i'm trying to think now i think the main one is probably frog of thunder which is the you know the bit in episode one that i spoke about earlier i think that's the main one but other than that, it was just kind of trims that you normally do, right? As you're trying to like pace up the scenes. Um, there's a million Owen Wilson jokes, obviously, because the joy of working with him is he always gives you the script and then he'll kind of throw in a few extras, you know? And I think that there's always so many options on the extras. So we kind of would pick our favorites or pick ones that felt they were still serving story, but really, you know, like a fun little Owenism that kind of gave a, a nice, I don't know, a richness to Mobius. So I think I'd say that there's a lot of his jokes obviously didn't get in because you have to pick one. <laughs> so, you know. Just for me, I, one of the things I absolutely loved was Richard E. Grant as old Loki. Um, yeah, I, I love the costume. I love the mentality. I'm a longtime fan of With Nail and I. Anybody yeah. that's hearing this that doesn't know With Nail and I, make sure to go see it mm -hmm. if you are over the age of 18, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I absolutely love it. And it's funny because in his speech, when he talks about mm -hmm. avoiding Thanos, who Loki wouldn't mm -hmm. really know who he is because this version doesn't, um, he, he talks about faking his death and sneaking away. Yeah. And there's really nothing to say that he didn't fake his death again 
versus <laughs> Alioth at the end because it's an old Loki trick. You like that concept, huh? I love that concept because it would be amazing if he lived and we could see more Richard E. Grant. What, what could you tell us about working with 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 him and just just kind of having all those variants and just you know the fun of an alligator Loki and everything else because it was just it was it was a moment that you know, fans just really enjoyed seeing. And, and yeah. I, I, you know, I know that the plot wouldn't necessitate any more of it, but I, yeah. I would have been happy with two more episodes of it. I think it was really fun for us, right? And it's so funny you mentioned about classic because I, I remember talking to ILM and did our effects and I was like, we need to see like his skeleton or his figure in there so we know he's dead. Because <laughs> I think for me, I always feel like, I mean, I love his performance, but I just felt, you know, his story starts from a place of cowardice, right? That he hid on that planet. And I thought there's something really beautiful about him going to face death bravely and that he does it, you know, powerfully. And, and I think for, for me, in my head, I'm always like, I, in my head, I think he's died. I do not know what Marvel's plans are, but like, but I, but as soon, but I was thinking, it's so funny you say that because as soon as we had that, you know, we had that story in there really early. But I was like, oh man, no matter what we do, people are going to think that he survived. They'll be like, he turned into a blade of grass or his helmet. But no, he, in, to me and the team, he he has passed and he did it, you know, heroically. Um, I'll, but yeah, I'll pour one out for old man Loki a little later. Yeah, <laughs> but with the variant Lokis, yeah, I mean it was joyful, right? Because I think for me, like and the team like you know we really wanted to get kid loki in there and there were so many versions of loki across the comics that we just wanted to kind of get in there because you can and i think that was fun with like because we had kid loki richard obviously is classic but i think the fun thing with classic was like you know the mcu has a very set uh kind of style right with their costumes which we know them for but i love the idea of putting richard in like the older costume because i was like well he's meant to be original loki so he should have like from the comics but also right on the filmmaking side, like he was in a Loki film like 40 years ago, because that just made me laugh. And I thought it felt real. And Richard very humbly and kindly accepted the costume that we made him when he looks fantastic. Um, and then like Boastful, for example, was an original Loki, because I think that was the fine balance, obviously, was that, you know, we have Alligator, which is like a genius idea from our writers and so funny. And I think that was the thing we wanted to have some new Lokis and original ones that could surprise people, but also it felt like a moment where we could, you know, because I like the comics and like having kid Loki in there, I was like, well, he's got to be there. So yeah. I think it was a place where it was like, well, we have to have kid. And um, I remember like the bandit Lokis, for example, they were always kind of led by a bandit, I think. And it was a really crazy fun scene and I loved it. But, and I remember that in episode two, obviously I had those holograms that looked just like Tom and it was really the throw people off the scent that it could be, you know, Sylvie and that we think the Loki under the hood just looks like Tom. And I was like, but we never deliver on that. And we never show a variant that looks like him or at least we hadn't planned to of our casting. And so I think me and my first AD were like, could we get him in as a bandit? Cause like I mentioned, our schedule was very tight. And then I remember that we were talking to the studio and I was like, oh, it could be cool if it's like President Loki in that moment. Right. And then I think once all of us were like, yeah, President, it's just like had to be Tom, right? So we we found a way to make it work, but it was kind of perfect. And, you know, and it was so fun, right? Because he gets, you know, his hand bitten off and does that ridiculous scream. And I think for us as well, it's he's such a villainous Loki in our show. And our Loki is obviously in a very different place now, like more in the anti-hero realm. It, it was fun, I think, to kind of show Tom playing those two different sides. So, yeah. Anyway, we had a lot of fun with Barbarians. But, yeah. I, I loved watching them. I would I, maybe if 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 old man Loki's <laughs> dead, classic Loki's dead. Uh, a flashback of more of adventures he and the alligator have together. Um, you yeah. know, just a, a few tiny little quirky questions. The, the yeah. trailer, you know, the title in the trailer was this beautiful, mm -hmm. colorful thing, and it's the muted black and white in the TV show. Mm -hmm. What what made you guys go from color to black and white, which is totally random? Mm. I think for us, it was like, because, you know, when I pitched the studio, because I remember reading in the scripts, like, I love the detective story in episode two and the variant attacking from the shadows. And it made me think of like film noir. And I just like, you know, a lot of my references for like lighting and style and how even just like how we angle our camera low, like, you know, it's very Fincher. <laughs> and like, and so I was like, well, I, I felt like that could carry across style wise across the show. But I think honestly, it was just, it felt aesthetically a bit more in tone with like just the design of the actual overall show and the look of the show. So that's why we had that shift, but we definitely wanted to keep the intention of the original logo, which is like, you know, 
identity, the many different faces Loki has with the shifting letters. So it was kind of honestly just more of an aesthetic thing. It was just shifting that to fit more within the design palette we'd made because obviously that particular logo was made so early. Right. Um, that makes, but that's that makes the sense. evolution of that. Yeah. A few people have asked, and I'm just curious if there's an official answer. Like in, in the comics, a female version of Loki was was known as Leah, and here it's mm -hmm. Sylvie. Was the mm -hmm. name change significant of anything, or was it just a kind of making her more of a variant and keeping it something new? I guess. I think with Sylvie, like basically, our intention was, and I must say, like she was, you know, she was in the scripts when I joined. So I, I don't want to like misspeak. This is from the writers, but at least our interpretation of it and obviously when I joined and understood it I thought it was quite cool right because she's an original character she's very different from Lady Loki in the comics um I think the only similarity would be they're both Lady Lokis that's right, it really right. she's, she's like a lady who's a Loki I guess but but she kind of you know she draws inspiration from Enchantress but I think that was the interesting thing for me even just in her appearance right is that it was that balance because I was like well she's a Loki but she's also been on the run. So that's where kind of the blonde hair idea came in, but it's died is because I was like, well, that's interesting. And she's also having this identity kind of crisis because she's like, don't call me a Loki. And it was right. the idea of, you know, you meet her with the horns, but as the show goes on, we kind of strip away. We do the same with Tom as well, but bits of their costumes get like, I think Die Hard was actually one of our references for this was like, you know, they get more muck, uh, mucky and dirty as like the adventure continues and more battered um, but with Sylvie in particular on the identity of it all you know she loses her horns she loses the variant cloak we see her hiding under and right. yeah and I think that was kind of tying into it but no I think with Sylvie she was always meant to be like an original character but drawing inspiration from the comics same as he who remains basically you know like in the comics he who remains is very different but it was sort of pulling inspiration from him and Mortis and like, and then original ideas from the writers. I, it, it totally works. I, you know, tell me something, what was the most like a personal moment for you? Cause what's mm. a moment that you, only you as a director could capture that maybe is reflexive of something in your life or something that you just wanted to sneak in there. Yes. This is previously existing intellectual mm. property, but what was something that you felt really personal about as, as a connection to it, be it a shot, mm a prop, something like that? I have three answers. <laughs> I just I'll, was take like, three. I'll take all three. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to remember the third one, but I can remember this. Oh, okay, so the first one is more like a fan moment. So this was what was personal to me because I love Loki and I love Tom's performance as Loki. And there's that thing as a director, right, where it's so surreal because I, I love Marvel. And I remember that in our show, obviously, he looks very different to what he's looked like in the MCU. You know, he's more in this detective kind of outfit. And I remember when we filmed Gobi, <laughs> I saw him in the original Loki outfit and I remember Tom kept taking the piss out of me but I remember saying to him I was like it's you because <laughs> I couldn't believe it I was like it's Loki and actually do it was like a very weird moment because I was like oh man they gave me this job and it was quite worrying I think because it was quite far into production that I had that moment but it was weird because you know like everyone I've seen him in the films I know his costume has adapted and changed but he was in that Asgardian Loki look and I just was like oh wow it's Loki so yes yeah, so that kind of blew my mind um, and then the two scenes I'm really proud of, I mean, these are just scenes I love. Like, so I, I love the scene of B15, uh, when she has her memories in the rain. And I think Wumi's performance there was really beautiful. And I remember there was a lot of discussions about, should we see her memories? Should we not see her memories? But it's something that me and my editor, Emma, we felt very passionate about not seeing, uh, because I just felt like, you know, this is a character that thinks they have power. They realize they don't have any power. And that, you know, their destiny is not what they thought it was. And it felt like a moment where I just wanted to give her character power in that moment. And it felt more impactful to me, one, because her performance is fantastic, but also her memories are private and they're hers. And then the other thing as a fan is like, what were her memories? So that's exciting to, you know, further right. road to be traveled. Yeah. Um, and then the third one, what was it? I'm trying to think now. Oh, my mind's gone blank. I'll just say those two. <laughs> I can't remember the third one. It's gone. Right. It's gone. The third but one yeah. has been the third one has been pruned. Um, <laughs> yeah. But look, look it, it's it's a it's a great story in which essentially in the movies Loki rose from villain to becoming a hero and made sacrifices, starting in Thor Ragnarok. Here we're seeing him go on a similar journey of self realization. So that makes sense. Tell me your self realization, your toughest scene. What was your toughest scene as a director? And how did you creatively rise to the challenge? Do you know what? My toughest scene as a director was Elias for multiple okay. reasons. 
One is I'm I'm quite shy and I've never done voice of God before, although I became easily like a monster very quickly. I remember again, all the all the actors were taking the piss out of me because they were like, oh, you enjoyed being on the microphone. And I was like, yeah, I did. But I felt like I was in the Truman Show. But I remember because I, <laughs> you know, we had these giant fans blaring and all the actors are on this patch of grass and they're surrounded by blue screen. And credit to them because it's not easy to do something like that because I had art at the time and a few previous sequences, but nothing for this finale. We had just some kind of, you know, test shots of what a life would look like because obviously it's such a massive piece of visual effects work. We just wouldn't have had like that much to show for it. So it took a, a lot of imagination from them. And then me and my editor, Callum Ross, in the edit, all Christmas, me and him and Jess, his assistant, we were trying to build this sequence. And I remember drawing like, maps of like this giant football field because that's kind of how we made it work with Kazra's set was that I had this football field design and we but we only had quadrants of it we could film at a time so I had to kind of map that out but it was definitely one of the most complicated things it looks quite simple when you watch it but it was very complicated to do and it was like and also working with Dan DeLue our visual effects supervisor and Jesse who worked from the third floor and did previous it was like all four of us over Christmas trying to bring a life to life basically for my director's cut so I could present it to the studio and I remember one of the things the studio said when they saw it was like oh this makes sense <laughs> I was just like hallelujah <laughs> you know because it's it sounds like it shouldn't be that complicated but it's just, it was a very complicated scene. And for me, it was a massive thing because as we said at the very beginning of our conversation, I hadn't done anything that visual effects heavy right. before. And obviously I'm working with people like Jesse and Dan DeLue who are like geniuses, but it was big, it was big. And like me and Callum, you know, he's my editor from Sex Education. So it was a big learning curve for him as well. And I think we were all just really proud of that sequence because we all worked really hard on it. And yeah, so I think that that's the sequence I'd be most proud of. <laughs> Did you need to reshoot anything about the last five minutes of, of, of the series when all the exposition is coming out? Was that one of your reshoots? Um, I'm just trying to think now, um, which bit, sorry? In with, with, with the, the one who remains, like that, those last five mm -hmm. minutes, like when everything's coming out. Was that something yeah. that was a reshoot or was that a, got, did you get that the first time? No, so I think basically the very end with Loki and the alternate TVA, literally just the bit in the archives with okay. the statue, he that little segment basically we filmed that segment in additional got it but loki oh this is my third one actually that i love <laughs> so loki in the time theater so this was the interesting thing and i think that's why you're always building it we knew that we wanted to show loki sat in this time theater and at the time we didn't know it was an alternate tva but i knew i wanted to have a shot so i was really inspired by the end of girlhood and it's a beautiful shot and it's basically she's kind of collecting herself and she's going to fight another day. And I love that moment. I think it's like a perfect, perfect ending. And so with Loki, I was inspired by that because, you know, he's had his heart broken and he's shattered and he feels betrayed, probably like so many different feelings. But I didn't want to leave him, you know, just feeling like that. And I think it was important to show that, you know, Loki's always survived and they're still fighting him. So we'd written that into the, you know, the script for the end. We didn't necessarily have the bit with the statue yet, but we knew we wanted to show that he still had fight and he was going to go and try and find Mobius. And so that's why I wanted to film it in that big, long push and take. Cause also when you're working with an actor like Tom, he's so good. You want to see that, you know, why not just stay on him and see that change in camera. So I filmed that. And then because we had the hallway, I was like, well, he's going to be finding Mobius, we think. So I'll film this bit with him walking through the hallway <laughs> and pushing past all, you know, the Minutemen. And then I think we'd filmed, so basically where he runs into the alternate TVA, like, you know, with the different bit and Casey, like that came later once we landed on, oh, it's an alternate TVA now. So I think that's just an example of like, sometimes I got stuff because I was like, well, let's just get this. And I've at least got then a piece of the puzzle if I need it. And if we end up changing it, then we change it. But yeah, but that's kind of how that all kind of came to be. They, they hired you for your vision, which you, you definitely had a great vision. What, what's the time when you had to say no, when the powers that be really wanted you to agree and you politely had to stand your ground and did it work out for you? I think probably the, it wasn't so much like a no, but, more just like the B-15 memories thing. I remember that being like a discussion, you know, like just being like, I was felt so strongly about that, but it wasn't like, 
you know, no, we can't. It was just more like, oh, but why? And then you say, and then they were like, okay, cool. Okay, I see where you're coming from. So, okay. no, I think they're a really collaborative studio. Honestly, I, I think they've spoiled me for the future because <laughs> I don't know how it's going to be working with people. Well, but speaking of your future, fun. and that's where we got to end. What, what, what are you yeah. on to next? I'm sorry that you're not coming back on <laughs> on season two. I know in a multiverse you are actually directing, <laughs> but but what are you what are you going on to next? So I have some projects that I'm writing basically. Um, that will be announced at some point. Um, right. Yeah, and I'm just, that's probably all I can say. Um, oh, but I probably could say I did write a comic book for Skybound. Um, okay. Yeah, which will be out at some point. Um, and that's probably I, all I can say about and that. And I think it's great that we're having, this, <laughs> we're having this conversation on what would have been the first day of Comic-Con in person if it was in person. Oh, so cool. I am so glad <laughs> we've been able to geek out on this, on this first day of Comic-Con, mm-hmm. and I'll be getting it up <laughs> this weekend. But look... You've been very generous with your time, and it's awesome that you were a podcast listener. You are Variant 28, and uh, I can't wait to see what you do next and and have you back. So thanks again for your time, Kate. No, thank you so much. It was just so cool to be on this because, like I said, listened to it when I was temping and gave me a lot of inspiration and just taught me a lot about writing and filmmaking. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. I can't wait to have you back. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to director Kate Heron for being so generous with her time in chatting about directing the first season of Loki. And I got to say, again, it was especially fun to have Kate on because she was a podcast listener before her first official directing gig. So that was really cool. And it was and it was just cool to hear all her enthusiasm for Loki. And of course, even to hear how she used to love listening to the podcast as a temp. I, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's totally fascinating to me and totally cool. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you'll also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, you know, if you've never read us before, our free issue happens to be a Marvel-themed issue. So it's the Avengers Endgame issue. And you could read it in its entirety and decide if it's right for you. And if it is, and I hope it is, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber to Backstory Magazine. And I want to entice you so you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number 5 at Backstory.net. And that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. And yes, you'll be able to use your credentials to log in on an iPad as well, but you can only use the coupon code at backstory.net. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my iTunes and Spotify podcast listeners. And of course, the YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. So you could see us do these interviews, support my passion project and become subscribers to Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. And folks, if you want to reach out to me, you can always find me on social media as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. Same titles on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith on Instagram, Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page. I don't use that much. But if you ever want to email me, you could always email Backstory Letters at gmail.com. I check that. I promise not to get back to you immediately as things are a little busy, but uh, I will get back to you. So don't worry. Um, You will get an email back. But look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.